March 1943. The North Atlantic has become a graveyard of ships. In just 20 days, 97 Allied merchant vessels have slipped beneath the freezing waves. Half a million tons of steel, food, and fuel lost to the depths. Admiral Karl Dönitz and his 400 operational U-boats prowl the convoy routes like wolves in the dark, their wolf packs bleeding the lifelines of Britain dry. The Allies are losing the tonnage war, and London's food reserves are dwindling fast. Yet beneath those cold black waters, something invisible is shifting. The Germans think they've mastered underwater detection with their hydrophones. The GHG systems capable of hearing convoys 8 to 10 miles away under perfect conditions. But perfection rarely exists in the Atlantic. Storms, temperature layers, and oceanic distortion make those systems nearly deaf beyond a few miles. Unbeknownst to the German captains, in secret labs in California and Britain, physicists and engineers are revolutionizing how the ocean itself is understood. At the University of California's Division of War Research and Britain's Admiralty Research Laboratory, scientists study underwater acoustics as if exploring an alien world. They map how sound travels through layers of seawater, how heat, salinity, and pressure bend, channel, and carry sound across immense distances. Their work leads to sonar systems that don't just hear better. They see with sound. By early 1943, U.S. destroyers begin deploying the QHB sonar, more sensitive and refined than any device before it. But sensitivity alone is not the breakthrough. It's the discovery of sound propagation, the realization that under certain oceanic conditions, sound doesn't fade. It travels, bouncing and channeling through deep sound layers, carrying the hum of submarine propellers for 20 miles or more. That changes everything. German captains have lived by one rule. Stay 10 miles away from destroyers, and you're safe. But that sanctuary no longer exists. Allied destroyers are now detecting U-boats at ranges the Germans believe are impossible, often without the submarines ever knowing they're being tracked. The hunters have become the hunted. For the first time in the war, U-boats begin disappearing without warning ambushed by destroyers that seem to materialize from nowhere. Reports flood Donitz's headquarters. Captains claim the enemy can hear through the ocean. Others suspect their codes have been broken. But it's not code-breaking. It's physics. Aboard the destroyer USS Bory, a relic of the old four-stacker fleet, two sonar operators sit in a cramped, dimly lit room, headphones pressed to their ears, they listen not just for sound, but for patterns. A submarine's propeller cavitation produces a rhythm distinct from anything else. Their QHB sonar filters every frequency, but that narrow hum between 200 and 800 hertz, isolating whispers of U-boats from the chaos of the ocean. The British contribute their own tools, Type 144 ASDIC sets using active pings and passive listening to triangulate targets. Canadian corvettes join the fight, learning to identify submarines by acoustic signature alone, distinguishing a Type 7 from a Type 9 just by sound. These advances converge under Admiral Max Horton's Western Approaches Command, which forms hunter-killer groups. Destroyers no longer guarding convoys, but roaming freely, responding to sonar contacts and hunting submarines with scientific precision. By the spring of 1943, the balance is turning. The Allies' hydrophones, once primitive, now map the ocean in acoustic grids. Every sonar ping, every contact, feeds back into data systems that predict how submarines move, dive, and die. The destroyers HMS Starling and USS Bory lead this new era. Their crews trained to interpret sound like language. Captain Frederick Walker's Black Swan sloops perfect the art of coordinated attacks, surrounding U-boats with precision born from long-range sonar. To the Germans, it feels supernatural. To the Allies, its science matured into strategy. 
Inside U-664, Captain Adolf Graef doesn't yet know he's part of this new equation. His boat drifts silently at periscope depth when the hydrophone operator hears something faint. A rhythmic pulse too distant to matter. Fifteen miles away, he estimates. Safe. But the bearing doesn't change. Over the next hour it closes. Twelve miles. Ten. Eight. The destroyer is coming straight for them. Grafe dives to 100 meters, then 150. His men ordered into silence. The temperature drops, condensation dripping from the pipes as the hull groans under pressure. They wait in the dark, motionless, believing they've vanished. Yet the destroyer above holds course, steady, relentless. It's as if it can see through the ocean itself. Grafe's world collapses around him. His tactics, silent running, sharp turns, diving through thermoclines, fail one after another. The destroyer keeps coming, guided by technology he doesn't understand. The men whisper of cursed ships, of allied magic. They hear nothing until the first depth charges fall. Distant thuds that shudder through the hull like hammer blows. Dust rains from the pipes, then closer explosions, the Atlantic itself convulsing as water becomes weapon. Panic swells, but discipline holds. The men are prey now, silent and waiting, in a steel coffin chased through the dark by unseen ears. The explanation for their doom lies in physics. Allied scientists discovered the deep sound channel, a layer in the ocean that traps and carries sound for immense distances. In the cold, layered Atlantic, submarine propeller noise travels not a few miles, but 20, even 30. The Germans had no reason to look for such a phenomenon. Their hydrophones were designed for attack, not survival. The Allies, driven by research and desperation, turned the ocean itself into a listening device. Every convoy now sails through acoustic corridors mapped to amplify their sonar reach. Destroyers adjust tactics with mathematical precision, reducing their own speed to lower propeller noise, listening during the night when temperature gradients make sound travel farther. Across the Atlantic, U-boat commanders report impossible encounters. Submarines detected while still submerged, attacked before surfacing, pursued for hours through the depths. Captain Peter Gerlach of U-403 writes in his log that the enemy must possess detection apparatus of extraordinary range and accuracy. His plea for technical investigation will come too late. The Allies' hunter-killer groups now use sonar data to set ambushes. One ship maintains contact, while others race ahead to intercept. Hedgehog mortars fire forward. Their contact fused explosives forming death circles across the surface. Unlike depth charges, these weapons detonate only on impact. Silence means a miss. An explosion means a kill. Precision replaces chance. By late 1943, submarine hunting has become an industrial science. Support groups sweep the Atlantic in vast sonar nets, their formations covering miles of ocean. Long-range detection gives destroyers the time to plan, coordinate, and strike surgically. The USS England will one day sink six Japanese submarines in 12 days using these same principles. The culmination of years of acoustic warfare born in the icy Atlantic. But in March 1943, aboard U-664, it's all happening for the first time. Grafe's men wait as the last depth charges detonate above them, the hull trembling with each concussion. The lights flicker. The air grows foul. The destroyer above has already plotted its final run. The ocean, once the German submarine sanctuary, has turned traitor. The hunters of the deep have become its ghosts, hunted by their own echoes.